Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Justin Crow, Associate Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Program in Leadership Studies. And I'm excited to have you all here for our program tonight, Countdown to 2020. And I'm especially excited to be joined on stage by Howard Dean. I trust that Howard needs no extensive introduction, so I will just note the top line highlights. As governor of Vermont from 1991 to 2003, Howard drew on, his, on the experiences of his long medical career to highlight the importance of health care, achieving nearly universal coverage for children through the creation of a publicly funded health care program that was generally regarded as one of the best, if not the single best in the entire nation. As a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president in 2004, Howard energized young voters and pioneered the sort of grassroots small donor, internet-based fundraising approach that was pretty radical then, but has since become commonplace among a lot of Democrats. As chair of the Democratic National Committee from 2005 to 2009, Howard's 50-state strategy helped to boost Democratic gains in the 2006 and 2008 elections, and I would argue seeded the possibility for Democratic resurgence in states that had all but been written off as solidly Republican. He is currently, among other things, a political commentator for CNN, a consultant to the law firm Denton's, and most importantly, of course, the Bennett Bosky Distinguished Visiting Professor of Leadership Studies at Williams. <laughs> Where he has, to rave student reviews, been teaching a course on leadership in a global world this semester. So I've organized this more or less as a conversation with me asking Howard some questions about the 2020 election, where we've been thus far, who interests him most, what we should expect to see going forward, before opening up to questions from all of you. Howard taught yesterday afternoon, has been meeting with students all day today, and is driving back to Burlington tonight, so we're going to try to wrap up by 8.45 or 9 p.m. at the absolute latest. Uh, and with that, please welcome Howard Dean, and we'll begin the conversation. Thank you. All right, Howard, we may still be two months from the first debate and still 10 months from the Iowa caucuses, but in our increasingly accelerated cycle and in our increasingly fast-paced political world, the 2020 campaign is obviously in full swing already. So as a way of kicking this off, I'm curious what has struck you most thus far? What has been the most pleasant development in these early months of the campaign? And what has been the most troubling one? Well, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be back in the southern tier of Vermont counties here. It's really just <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I think the um, the most pleasant thing about the campaign is the enormous number of incredibly well qualified candidates. The uh, the press, in all its wisdom, a year and a half ago, was writing uh, writing about how sh small the and insignificant the bench was in the Democratic Party, and I think we've got. 15 or 20 people running who would be fantastic presidents. Um, the only problem is we're gonna, all going to have trouble making up our mind about just who that should be. Um, and and they, you know, initially, um, you know, I, I, I have to be careful because I'm now uh, running a data project for the Democrats trying to get our data um, coordinated. So I'm really not going to take sides, as I did not when I was the referee between uh, President Obama and Hillary when they ran in 2008. Um, but I, I don't mind saying things that I've already said. Um, I, I'm hoping for a candidate who's 50 or under, and the reason for that has nothing to do with the 70-year-olds, who I think are pretty incredible people. It has to do with the nature of the Democratic Party is shifting dramatically, and the Democratic Party is being taken over by people who are in their 20s in an informal way. They're not doing, the DNC is not being taken over by people in their 20s, but most of the people who won the elections for us in the congressional election uh, were 20 and 30 years old. Uh, the 40 seats were mostly picked up uh, by uh, people who like uh, run for something, a collective pack, color of change, Voto Latino, um, Emerge is another one. I mean, there was 11 groups that coordinated and I was helpful along with other people, including Hillary Clinton, in financing them, because that's the future of the Democratic Party's young people. In 2017, in the Virginia elections, which is generally predictive of what's gonna happen for the rest of the cycle, 
69% of people under 30 years old voted for somebody who I would characterize as a boring centrist Democrat for governor. 69% of people under 30. That is the future of our, our country. Our country, our party, core groups are young people, people of color, and women. If they come out, we win. If they don't come out, Trump wins. It's as simple as that. So the party has changed dramatically. Uh, I also think it's probably the last time two white males are going to run uh, as the, in the top two uh, offices for us because our party has to look like or I, our ticket has to look like the people whose votes we're asking for. So I think you're going to see a very, very different contest from now on. The Democrats have changed. The good news is for the Democrats is that's the future of the country. The country looks like, uh, is going to look like by 2040 what the Democratic Party looks like today. So um, I'm not going to choose between candidates. I've said what I've said. I, if I had the, my Democratic position earlier, I wouldn't have even said that much, but I did. And is there anything that, that strikes you about the early months? I'm not asking about specific candidates, but about the tenor of the debate that strikes you as, as worrisome, as problematic. Well, I worry, you know, I worry about um, uh, sort of some of the backbiting that's going on. That killed us in 2016, or it helped to kill us. We don't need that. We don't want that. And I actually expect that to be self-policed, because in a multi-candidate race, that's fatal. Uh, if you're somebody who's uh, going negative on your opponent in a multi-candidate race, um, you may hurt your opponent, um, but you'll drive away other voters who are in question. So I I'm pretty optimistic about how this is going to turn out, but, you know, the Democrats have nominated the wrong person before, and that's always possible, too. But I'm very, very pleased about the huge uh, explosion of young people who believe in politics who didn't before November of 2016 when they finally realized that they didn't participate, if they weren't at the table, they were going to be on the menu, as they say. So as a former DNC chair, you have a better sense than almost anyone about democratic messaging, democratic strategy. So I wonder, in watching and listening to the candidates over the last few months, what you think about how they're framing and how they're shaping what it means to be a Democrat in the Trump era. Uh, again, this isn't about individual candidates. Right. I'll get to them in a moment, but collectively, are there issues that you feel like, based on your experience in the party and, or your read of the political scene, that Democrats should be talking about more? Are there is issues that they should be talking about less? Are there issues they should just be talking about in a fundamentally different way than they are? There's no uh, direction that I'm really worried about, um, but I'll post a few warning signs. First of all, the, the media is mostly about clicks, not always about news. So. The, we, we're, we're not going to have a message until we have a candidate. We never have a message until we have a candidate. The Republicans never have a message until they have a candidate. You, when you're running as the uh, out-of-office party, the president command of the other party commands the, the message stage, and Trump is very, very good at that. Um, our object now and during the campaign is not to attack Donald Trump. Donald Trump will attack himself every day, and we do not have to do that for him. If we do it, we're losing an opportunity to talk about what we want to do for the country. So lesson number one is let's not get too excited about messages. Trump carries our message every day, which is we're not Trump, and that's fine. Uh, that worked for us pretty well when we picked up 40 seats in 2018. Uh, what I'm interested in is a candidate who's going to stick to not Trump and his scandals, but uh, stick to what we're going to do to change the country for the better. Uh, a lot of people unexpectedly had their taxes go up. That's going to be an important issue. Uh, the Trump administration is trying to take away people's health care and get rid of pre-existing pre pre uh, um, condition uh, prohibitions. That's going to be a major issue. That was a major contributor to winning the 40 seats. Let me just deal with one more myth. The Democratic Party is not moving to the left. It is moving to the center. And how do I know this? Uh, because the media, of course, is obsessed with three, I think, wonderful Congress people who are out there saying all kinds of things and need to be said. The other 37 states came from places like Oklahoma, Texas, Orange County, California, and Central Pennsylvania. In order for those people to win, they had to be centrist. So do not believe lazy, intellectually lazy, press people work hard, but intellectually unbelievably lazy people who participate in packed journalism more than at any time during presidential races. I saw this in my own race. Uh, it is nonsense. 
Go beneath the story, look at the facts, do not believe what the New York Times writes, and certainly don't be amused by anything except the New York Post headlines. You said you, know, you, want, a, you want a candidate or you think it's best from the party to, to kind of stay clear of bashing Trump on a regular basis, that, uh, right. th that that's not to the interest of the Democrats. What, I mean, does the, is there anything that would come out in the Mueller report that would, that would change your mind? Is this something that is an opportunity for Democrats to hit on whether it's narratives of fitness for office or wrongdoing, or do you really think that Democrats are best served by just making a purely affirmative case for why no, I think we ought to d treat, do it the way Amy Klobuchar did it at her announcement. She announces in a, in a snowstorm. Uh, Trump puts out some tweet that makes fun of her. Her response is, what do you think Donald's hair would like look like in a snowstorm? And then she starts talking about Social Security, decent Medicare, the better jobs, and so forth and so on. So you just, to Trump. Trump will give the, his own message. He has his own message. Most people do not approve of it, otherwise he'd be at 50% instead of 40% in the polls. He, he, and he will not be able to resist being the center of attention. That is good for us, but we need to have a message that we can make things better, that we can stop the circus and the farce that's going on and nothing's being done, and we have to talk about how we're going to do that. That is the message that we have to have for the American people, and so far I think we're doing a reasonable job of that. All right, so you've, you've mentioned a couple candidates along the way, and I want to dive into them, a kind of lightning round of the Democratic field here. So I'll name a candidate. You give me your report card, your impressions, whatever you'd like. Can I give everybody an A plus? I already told you you're not allowed to do that this right. semester. So uh, you... <laughs> you There's several members of my class in here who you just lost the vote of. If you're <laughs> I'm fortunately not running for anything. I have tenure. <laughs> You give me a quick report card, or if you want to be political about it, Howard, just your impressions okay. um, on what they've shown you thus far. Okay? Ready? He's not technically in yet, but all accounts suggest he will be. Former Vice President Joe Biden. Um, I think he has an uphill climb, but he's certainly going to be initially the dominant factor in the race. But I think it's an uphill climb for him. What's the uphill climb about? Why uh, is it so he's uphill? He's been around a very long time, and there's a whole lot of things that people are going to talk about that they're not talking about now. Your home state senator, Bernie Sanders. Uh, I think he's got staying power. He'll be in it till the end because he has a very, very loyal fam uh, following. And the question is, um, you know, what kind of a race is he going to win and how many enemies he makes along the way? Because that'll hurt him if he does. Our home state senator, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, probably the best person in the race on policy issues. Uh, she has to raise money and keep up with the front runners, and that's going to be hard for her. One of the early front runners and uh, big uh, fundraisers, California Senator Kamala Harris. She's doing very well. It's too early to tell. She's a rookie on the national scene, but because she comes from California, she's done a fantastic job fundraising. And she's also uh, in the top tier in South Carolina, which is very important for her. The candidate with the most momentum at the moment, South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Uh, we don't know. He's brand new to the race, but it's extraordinary what he's done. He reminds me of somebody who ran in 2004 and took off like a rocket. <laughs> the only thing is I've got to coach him not to give a list of states at the end of the tour. <laughs> the candidate who probably generates the most tweets and memes and press coverage, both fawning and skeptical, Representative Beto O'Rourke. I think the jury's out on him. He ran an unbelievable campaign. The interesting thing about Beto is uh, that what you see is less than what you get. Uh, people inside Washington who know him have an enormous amount of respect for him. My personal favorite, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, we talked about her a little bit. I think she's very well equipped to handle uh, Donald Trump. And I think that's going to, she has to raise the money. That's the problem. What makes her so well equipped to? I, well, that's Trump. what I talked about when I talked about her announcement, which was just you, 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 you strike back at Trump enough to make him look ridiculous, which you don't need a lot of help doing, and then you talk about the fundamental things that worry uh, the American people. And Trump has Trump has basically not delivered much uh, during his four years for the people who really had economic concerns. You're not going to get the neo-Nazi can group to vote for anybody else, but there are a whole lot of Americans who voted for Donald Trump because they're really worried about their future and they're struggling. And if you've got to address that, then um, we can win. And I think that's what Amy was doing during her announcement. Now, again, these are all, every one of these candidates is a long shot. You have 13, we have more than 13 candidates, but you probably have 12 or 13 that are well qualified and 
uh, to, to be running. And a lot of it's going to come down to how much money you can raise. And there are going to be a lot of really good candidates that can't raise the money. And that's just too bad, but if, if that's the way it goes. And we're not talking about, you know, big donors either. For the most of these candidates, you're going to have to raise it um, online. And some will and some won't. One of Klobuchar's colleagues from New Jersey, Cory Booker. Uh, Booker is doing, I think, better than expected, particularly in South Carolina. So we, again, he's another candidate we don't know, and we're probably not going to know for until six months from now how well he's doing. And a lot of that is going to have to do the next with the next two quarters of fundraising. Are there other names, either declared candidates like New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand or former HUD Secretary Julian Castro, or not yet declared candidates like former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams? that we should be talking about? Other names that could make a difference? Well, I'm a role. huge, personally huge fan of Kirsten's. I know her very well, and I like her a lot, and we can get into all the Al Franken stuff if you want to. Um, but I think she probably did the right thing, painful as it is, because I think Al Franken was a great senator. Um, I, uh, there, I mean, again, there are others. A lot of it's going to come down to who can raise the money. And if you can't raise the money, you really can't get past Iowa, that's a huge, Iowa is unbelievably expensive. They've changed the rules in Iowa sometimes, so it's a little more democratic. That is, you can absentee vote now, they're gonna have a caucus, uh, caucus which absentee ballots will be counted at, they're gonna use um, instant runoff voting uh, in the caucuses, which will make it more um, democratic. So there are some changes they've made, but it's still unbelievably expensive to organize. I realized that Barack Obama could be president of the United States when he won in Iowa, beat Hillary in Iowa. I thought, and I don't mean uh, that he could win the nomination, that if he was sufficiently uh, a, a strong enough leader that he could organize a campaign that could win Iowa um, coming from nowhere, that he was uh, the person who could, in fact, lead the United States of America. That's how hard it is to win Iowa. It is unbelievably difficult. The logistics are unbelievably complicated. The discipline that's needed to count every vote and keep track of all the voters uh, is uh, really extraordinary. And when Obama did it as a relative rookie in politics, uh, it was incredibly impressive. And that's what we're going to see again. Who Some people could be able to do this and some people won't. And the honest truth is, Sitting here tonight, we have absolutely no idea who's going to be a do, able to do a good job and who's not, except we do know that Bernie's going to do a good job because he's done it before. He is the only one that's done this before in any meaningful way. Biden's run two or three times before, but hasn't gotten past Iowa. So Bernie Sanders is really the only one uh, that ha we know uh, can get through Iowa. And there are going to be four or five other ones. We just don't know who they are yet. So I gave you all those candidates before, but that's probably half the field, right? There's all sorts of people we haven't talked about. Jay Inslee, John Hickenlooper, Steve Bullock, Tulsi Gabbard, on and on, Andrew Yang. Um, I wonder, I mean, almost all of these people are gonna end up on the debate stage because of the DNC's rules and what they set as the threshold. What do you see as the kind of benefits and liabilities of what is going to be a debate stage of perhaps 18 or 19? Well, actually, it won't, doesn't work like that. First of all, you have to get 65,000 small donations from 20 states. That's going to knock a lot of people out there who are in there for vanity reasons. But even Yang already has that, doesn't he? And he may. I don't know. I mean, I, I thought that most of the indications were that almost all of them seemed likely to clear. Me, I, I just find that hard to believe. Um, you know, so 65,000 donations from 20 states. Uh, and you have to be at 1% in the polls. If you're, let, if you're not in the polls, then you don't get on. And there's also two debate stages. We're not having the varsity and the junior varsity like the Republicans did. It'll be at random, which I think is a much better way to do it. But they're going to be two separate nights back to back with the candidates. And the candidates will be a mixture of all kinds of different people, some well-known by that time and some not so well-known. So I, you know, I think we can get through this. What we don't want is a debate stage with 15 people on it. Nothing serious happens then. The debates are a great opportunity for Americans to decide who they like and who maybe they don't like. And they do make a, a significant difference, especially if somebody does well in them. In part, I think, because of the historically diverse, both in terms of race and gender field this cycle, there's been a lot of early talk of running mates, of whether male candidates would pledge to pick a female running mate, of whether the Democratic ticket needs racial diversi diversity to match its coalition, things of that nature. So if you had the smoke-filled backroom authority to match up two candidates, I'm not going to ask you which two. I know you're not going to answer that. But what kind of ticket would you want? if we're thinking about the various constituencies in the Democratic Party, both demographic and issue-based, 
What kind of ticket would you want to set up the Democrats best to challenge Trump Pence? Um, well, I can tell you what, it of course, it depends on who the nominee is. It makes a big difference. Uh, but one of the candidates I have my eye on for vice president is Stacey Abrams. Uh, she clearly outshone Trump at the inaugural address. She's very level-headed. She, what she did in Georgia, well, actually, I think she won in Georgia, had it not been for Brian Kemp being the Secretary of State and caging votes at the same time he was running for governor. Um, and so she's an incredible candidate, unbelievably articulate and very smart. Um, but, you know, we do have to have diversity in the ticket, so largely that's just one suggestion. There'll be many others. There are many combinations of people who are actually running for office uh, who could be the number two person if they're not the number one. I'd certainly put Julian Castro in that uh, range. I'd, I'd put, if, if the, if the uh, winner is a male, I'd certainly put any of the women who are running as the, uh, uh, in that category, and if, a w w uh, if the winner is a female, then I would put, um, you know, some of the men who are running. I mean, this is, you know, you have 20 people running, you've got a lot of choices, and there are some really, really good choices. What's the kind of ticket that would be problematic, that you think would be damaging to the party or difficult to challenge the president? Again, not specific people, but what does the party need to avoid? Yeah, I think a monochromatic ticket in a multicultural uh, party is a huge mistake. Um, we spent most of the time on the Democrats, obviously, mostly because I think it's more interesting to talk about right now. <laughs> but Better for your health and my blood pressure, too. <laughs> but I want to move off them briefly to ask, first, about a potential independent, and second, about the president and perhaps the quixotic challenges to him. The independent, of course, is former Starbucks chairman and CEO Howard Schultz, a figure whose emergence was initially met, I think, with kind of democratic trepidation of the possibility of him acting as a spoiler, but he now seems to be more or less relegated to, to irrelevance. Is there any possibility for someone like Schultz to become a meaningful figure in this race? Or sure. in our climate, is there just not the possibility for a centrist in a polarized I don't find world? Schultz to be a centrist. He's just a moderate, One more, who claims to be a more centrist. moderate Republican. Uh, and he certainly has no interest whatsoever in the working people of this country. If you look at his platform, he's called it, he's called all the things Democrats do immoral. So health care for everybody is immoral. I mean, this is a vanity candidacy uh, by a guy who probably should spend his money doing something more constructive. But the problem is it could absolutely, it could absolutely reelect Donald Trump. He was at 6% the last I saw. I'd be shocked if he gets even that. That's enough to tilt Iowa and a few other critical states. So. You know, the question is, if you're Howard, Howard Schultz, do you really help your country as you claim you're going to and reelect Donald Trump, or do you uh, do something more constructive? What about the president? What are his electoral strengths and electoral weaknesses heading into his reelection? Ah, um, well. <laughs> it's the first question I've asked about him. He has somewhere around 35 or 40 percent of people who are going to vote for him no matter what, even if he does shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, as he famously said in the, in the campaign. Um, he also you know, is a crook, and I think most people believe that, I think including most of the people who vote for him, but they just excuse it. Um, so it's a very polarized electorate. He has full command of the Republican Party. Anybody who challenges him will never be heard from again, um, <laughs> maybe literally, so watch out. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, uh, Trump, you have to take Trump's, we could lose this election. And anybody who thinks otherwise uh, ought to go back and look and see what happened in 2016 where we were all shocked. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, he's the president of the United States, he's incumbent president. I think, I think we've only, I think the non-incumbent challenging a, a, sec, a person, president running for the second term has only won something like four out of the last 12 or 13 elections. I don't remember exactly what the statistic is. So, you know, he has a big advantage going in. He has lots of money. Um, and presumably he'll get a little Russian money again, too. Uh, so uh, we'll see. I mean, it's, you know, this is not going to be an easy race. Um, and again, we don't have to remind everybody that he's a crook. They already believe he's a crook, including his supporters. Uh, they just have forgiven him because they're angry and they just like the, some of his, the things he has to say. We're not going to pick up those people. The question is, can we get our people out to vote? And can we talk to the people who did vote for Trump and now regret it, of which there are a number of farmers in the Midwest because of the soybean uh, embargo has really uh, made them vassals of the, of the state. And they don't like, these are people who like to work for a living. And they are basically know they're being paid by the government. And they don't really enjoy that. 
So you referenced the fact that the president retains support from the overwhelming majority of Republicans. And yet, given his divergence from the kind of classic and Repu classical Republican orthodoxy on everything from trade to Russia, there's also some accounts that he's alienated some moderate business-minded voters, especially college-educated suburban women. Um, it's, I think it's folly to suggest that any of the potential challengers to him, John Kasich or Larry Hogan or Bill Weld, would be anything more than kind of flies for him to swat away en route to the nomination. But I wonder if you think that any of them or any others can do anything to weaken him. Heading into 2020, do you think we're more likely to see continued lockstep support among the president's base, or are there possibilities for cracks in the partisan armor? Well, look, there's always possibilities for cracks. I, you know, my honest opinion is that the Republican Party is gonna collapse. Uh, the Democratic Party is already being taken over by young people, and it's a, more or less of a friendly takeover, certainly not a hostile takeover. One of the things I give Perez a lot of credit for is accepting that. For example, in Virginia, we elected a slate with uh, uh, 11 out of 15 women, uh, many people of color, the first transgender person um, elected to a state legislature, a gay person. This is in Virginia, right? Now, we did that because a, a lot of these young internet groups primaried uh, state party candidates, and they won. State party supported them. So this was not, we're not at war with each other as they are on the Republican side. And the other thing we have on our side, assuming we continue to operate in a reasonable, above board, and fair way, is young people who are not gonna leave. They've voted for Democrats three elections in a row, two, twice for Barack Obama and once for Hillary Clinton. And they're not gonna switch, the, once you do that, it's gonna take a miracle to, or some catastrophic event to make them change. So my own view of this is that in the Democratic Party, we are gradually ceding power to the younger people who are taking it, and we're supporting that for the most part. There are people who resist, but for the most part, we're supporting the generational change, and I think that's critical that we do that. On the Republican side, they're just getting older. They're 20 years older than we are. Uh, I, I, <laughs> there were more transgender delegates on the floor of the Democratic Convention than there were African-American delegates on the floor of the Republican Convention. I mean, this is not a party of diversity, and this is a country of diversity. I think they're going to explode. Um, and the problem that they have, which I don't think they realize yet, because they probably believe all this crap about the Democrats moving further to the left, is this younger generation is really interesting. Yes, it's true that there's debates about health care for all. Health care for all is no longer a socialist plot. It's so common decency now, now, and that's widely accepted by most Americans. So the country may be moving a little to the left, this generation, when they take over, is actually somewhat libertarian. Um, the younger, younger people are. I don't mean libertarian in the sort of hardline Ayn Rand uh, libertarianism. I think they would like to shrink government. And it's gonna be amazing to the older left wing of my party when they do take over. And I don't mean they're gonna shrink government in the, in the punitive way the Republicans wanna do it. They're simply gonna do things like we do in Vermont. We don't do women's health care in Vermont. We write a check to Planned Parenthood. They do women's health care. We don't do mental health care in Vermont. We write a check to the 14 community mental health centers. They do uh, health care. This is a generation that does not like institutions. And the bigger and clunkier the institution, the less they like it. So I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating when they do take over, because they're going to do some things that are not considered uh, orthodoxy. They don't particularly like unions in this, in this young group because they don't like big institutions. So it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what's going to happen inside the Democratic Party, but it is going to be a gradual takeover. That is not the case in the Republican Party. There's no way that you can reconcile the old moderate uh, Northeastern Democrats, uh, Republicans, if there are any left, uh, with the right-wing uh, hate groups uh, in, the, in the Tea Party. And the Tea Party is what controls the Republican Party. They have an enormous problem. They are so far from where the mainstream is. And right now they're lashing out in hate and anger against an establishment that hasn't provided. By the way, if anybody wants to read a good book, Anand Jidaharis has just written something called Winners Take All. It's probably, it's a really interesting read about this very phenomenon and explains a lot about, without talking about Trump that much, explains a lot about what's the matter with American capitalism. We don't need to give up capitalism, but we do need to alter it so that it benefits everybody. That's where the Democrats are going. The Republicans have no idea where they're going, and that's a bad sign for reconstituting your party. 
So thinking beyond the presidency, I want to talk a bit about the battles for control of the House and the Senate. As DNC chair, you were known for the 50 state strategy for trying to get Democrats to invest and over time compete and eventually one day win in states where they had been struggling. So I wonder how you see the geographic map shaping up, and I don't just mean electoral college blue red here, uh, shaping up heading into 2020. Are Democrats actually ready to win statewide races in states like Georgia and Texas, or take stronger control in states where they've been able to win sometimes, like North Carolina and Arizona, well, we, all of which have Republicans up for election? We picked up seven legislatures, legislative bodies in the last election out of 99. That was a significant improvement. We need to pick up more. Um, so I think we can continue to do that, um, but we have to work at it. We have to recruit candidates, and the younger the better. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do, do, do I think we're going to do this all in one election? No. I Look, the odds against picking up the Senate are significant. I think it's possible, but this is going to be close. We, we, we didn't get into this overnight, and we're not going to get out of this overnight, um, but we did get off to a really good start in 2018, and I think we're going to further that in in 2020. Look, there's a lot of things that have to go right for us, um, and they may not all go right. I, I, I can't predict what's going to happen, and since I was wrong 51 out of 52 weeks in a row in the last election, I'm not so an anxious to predict anymore. What do you expect to see of Democrats who are trying to retain the suburban seats that they flip from red to blue in places like Orange County or Virginia or Iowa? All of these, as you talked about, the kind of centrist move in the Democratic Party. What do you expect to see out of those people that's going to look different from other places in the party? Good government and an attack on corruption. Look, we have legalized corruption in this, in this country to a large degree. I do a lot of work out of country, and one of the countries I've done a lot of work in is Ukraine. And when Yanukovych was president, I was in Ukraine, and I went to see his chief of staff, who was actually, they had a quota, one honest person allowed in Yanukovych's administration. And she was about six feet tall. She was an economics professor. She only lasted a year because she was the one honest person and they had to get rid of her too. So we're having this discussion and I'm saying, well, you know, you, you, if you want to try your political opponents, uh, Yulia Chimachenko in this case, you need to try her in the European court. Send her out because nobody's going to believe in an emerging democracy when you, you know, bring charges against your opponent that it's not politically motivated. And we talk about the Russians for a while. This is before they invaded the eastern Ukraine. And then I finally said, and you know, we've got to do something about oligarchs running political parties. And then I looked at her and I said, oh, Madam Chief of Staff, I can't give you this part of my talk because our court has just legalized oligarchs running political parties in the United States. You know, we have legalized corruption in this country, and that's going to have to change. That is the central theme of which we can win. People believe Donald Trump is corrupt. Uh, it's, you know, he is corrupt, and he has been all his business life. Um, and... Um, I, don't, I think people are sick of it because if there's one thing that doesn't, isn't fair, it's corruption that advantages the people who already have plenty. And that's one of the reasons they voted against Hillary because there was a lot of reasons, but part of it was she was seen as the establishment and Trump wasn't the establishment. Trump is now the establishment. He's going to do his best not to be, but it's on his watch. It's been four years and nothing has gotten better for most of those people. All right, last question for me. A nameless 2020 candidate comes to you and says, Howard, how do I become president? What, based on your own experience running, what do you tell this candidate to do and what do you tell this candidate not to do? <laughs> Don't give any lists of states. <laughs> no, um, I tell them it's going to get harder. Um, this is the hardest, th look, this is an incredibly unpleasant, difficult process. I loved it. I was really glad I did it. It is absolutely brutal. Uh, the press will build you up when, when you're good clickbait, and then when you get to the top, they'll tear you down. They say stuff in the best papers in the country that are absolutely not true, and they don't care. Uh, and it's not just to me. They do this to everybody. Um, they, ev your opponents, my four uh, chief opponents in Iowa, their press people used to get together every day to decide what the attack line on Dean was going to be because I was in the front. I don't think we should change the process. This is the hardest job in the world. And if you can't get through this job, you shouldn't, this, this process, you shouldn't be president of the United States. If you can't stand up to the press in Iowa and your opponents saying mean things about you, and some of them were calling, their offices were calling people at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, oh, we're from the Dean campaign. We would like to ask you some questions about the environment. This kind of stuff happens all the time. It's a nasty, tough game. And the reason is politics is nothing but a substitute for war. 
War is about allocation and succession. Well, politics is about two things, allocation and succession. So we just had the French Revolution in the United States in 2016, and nobody went to the guillotine. That's an improvement. But the instincts are the same, and it's why this is such a tough business. But if you can't survive this tough, mean, horrible process, what are you going to do when Vladimir Putin demands Alaska back? So you'd better be tough. You'd better be able to get through the process. So all I just say is get ready, because if you have any illusions about how lovely and democratic and kumbaya this is, it is not. It is a war. And if you get your, it's one of the reasons that in general, with the exception of the two Obama campaigns, which are the best campaigns I ever saw in my life, Republicans run better campaigns than we do. They understood that the word campaign comes from war. And it is a war. They're top down, they're disciplined, they don't care what the facts are, they're great at propaganda, and they're better at it than we are, because we like to debate, we like to discuss policy, we like to talk about issues. That's fine, as long as we're tough enough to win. That's what I'd tell a candidate. You better be tough, and you better not expect anything but the most toughest, meanest stuff that'd be done to you, and don't whine to me about ethics, just get back out there and start kicking butt, because that's what you have to do to be President of the United States. <laughs> So I want to open this up to all of you. Before I do so, though, just a couple of requests. One, uh, I ask that you limit yourself to a single question rather than a series of them or a comment disguised as a question. I understand fully that many of you have thoughts about lots of these issues, about the campaign, about the candidates, about the president, so forth. But it's precisely because so many of you have thoughts that I'd like to keep us moving and see if we can get to as many of them as possible. And I also just want to remind everyone that we try to reserve the first few questions for students. Um, Carrie, if you could signal to me when it's about 8.40, since I didn't bring my watch, I would appreciate it. Thank you. All right, questions. First few from students. Yeah, Christian. Um, so obviously, obviously a lot of um, the like populist uh, right-wing sentiment and the uh, feeling of disenfranchisement won't go away in America if a Democrat is elected um, in 2020. So what would you say to, or what do you think a Democrat who wins could do to help like mitigate those problems that got Trump elected and all those kind? Because you know. Technology is advancing, the jobs aren't coming back. Um, so what, what do you think a candidate could do to kind of um, help mitigate all of those issues? There did everyone hear? Christian projects pretty well, but did everyone hear that? No? OK, so just going to, I'm sorry? Sure. That, that's what I'm about to do, yes. Uh, his question was, uh, what can Democrats do to push back against the kind of uh, forces that are motivating right-wing populism? Does that summarize it fairly enough, Christian? Uh, just uh, for advertising, this is one of my students who I'm extremely proud of. Thank you, Christian. This was not a setup. You do, however, get an A-plus in the course. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Discussion for later, yeah. Howard. <laughs> so um, I actually think it is possible to win these folks back. We're not going to win the people back who are filled with hate, whether it's against gay people or Muslims or whatever it is. But there, you know, again, the, I think the majority of people who voted for Donald Trump wanted change and were in some desperate way worried about the future, their own future and their children's future. Here's what we have to do. Number one, we do have to make health care available for everybody. It takes an enormous amount of anxiety off the table for working class people who are still going to the emergency room and getting $5,000 bills or sometimes $35,000 bills. That's ridiculous. Medicare for all, we have to be very careful of that phrase because it means different things to different people. Medicare for all is a good idea. How you get there matters a lot. And if you take away everybody's health insurance, they're not going to be happy about it and it's going to blow up in our face. So I think we have to take a non-ideological approach to it, but I think we have to make sure everybody's covered. That's going to help rural people a lot. Right now, rural people are, are suffering because uh, Republican governors, out of spite, won't take Medicare, uh, take, take the Medicaid expansion. Georgia lost four rural hospitals last year alone because the governor wouldn't take Medicaid expansion. Um, it, it, you know, it's a huge boost to the economy of a state to take Medicaid ex expansion since the federal government supplies 50 to 80 percent of the money. So that's number one. Number two, we need to change the tax code dramatically. The tax code is built to advantage the people who don't need it. Um, the tax cuts went to people. The smart economist 
would have advised Trump were he willing to do it, don't give $1.7 trillion, the vast amount of which goes to the top 5% of income earners in the country. If you want to give people a $1.7 trillion tax cut, get rid of student debt, pay it off, because that's the same amount of money, and it goes to people who have to spend it. If you think that $1.7 trillion, uh, what's his name, Diamond, Jamie Diamond, admitted the other day that $3.7 billion of the profit that J.P. Morgan Chase made was simply because of the tax cuts. Now, excuse me, but that was our money. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to have to pay those deficits. So why would you give $3.7 billion to J.P. Morgan Chase to enhance their bottom line? That does exactly nothing for the economy. If you'd taken that $3.7 billion and paid off the loans of all the people who are going to community colleges in this country, all of a sudden they have to spend that money. They don't have any money. That really is a boost to the economy. The other tax change that has to be made, the main tax change that has to be made is, we, look, tax code, this is, we live in a capitalist society. People like getting rich. There's nothing wrong with that. Nobody ever won election by blaming uh, everything on rich people because most people hope to be rich themselves one day. That is a, not a winning strategy. The winning strategy is to change the tax code. So let people get rich in America, but not by trading collateral mortgage, collateralized mortgage obligation, derivatives, derivatives of derivatives, um, carried interest, all this stuff just makes a very few people in the banking business and the real estate business a lot of money. What we really want to do is give people big tax breaks for investing in creating jobs and building factories and schools in North Adams or in rural Kentucky or in West Virginia. Does that mean those folks are going to suddenly vote for us? No, I don't expect we're going to win Kentucky or West Virginia. What we're really trying to do is heal the country. That's the most important thing. If we aim to do that, we're going to win back enough votes from people who now believe that the Democrats are serious about their particular situation. We do not have to give up anything on human rights. We do not have to give up anything on women's reproductive health care. We do have to acknowledge the economic pain that is poorly distributed across America and fix it. We do not need to engage in socialism for everybody or any of that kind of stuff, or who cares? Socialism is, isn't a bad word anymore anyway. But we do have to make people believe that this is a fair society, and we're not going to make them believe that unless we make it more of a fair society. And changing the ca tax code and universal health care are the first two obvious steps to doing that. Another question from a student. You're not a student, McPartland. Miranda. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you think that young people hate institutions. And I was just wondering why. I don't trust them. institutions and don't think we need them. Don't trust institutions and don't think we need them. And I was just wondering if um, you think that, why you think that institutions in general as opposed to just our current institutions or the way they're operating or who they're serving, why do you think it's a general dysfunction? The question is about the skepticism among young people of institutions generally. We, in my generation, marched around the Pentagon, figuratively speaking, seven years before he got us out of Vietnam. You went online and in two days made Mike Pence rescind the anti-gay bill that he passed when he was governor, uh, he had passed as governor of Indiana because you went online and generated millions of signatures to 11 corporations that were about to do business or were doing business in Indiana, and they all went to Pence and said, if you don't undo this, we're leaving. Now, if you can do that, why would you need an institution? And you do it again and again and again. One of my favorite stories is in 2008, a woman named Molly Catchpole graduated from Roger Williams College in Rhode Island, which is a working class college, first in her family to go to generation to go to college. She graduates, it's 2008, she, of course she can't find a job. She's living in her parents' house, doing a little nannying on the side, and she's in trouble. Verizon, I mean, uh, Bank of America decides they're gonna charge everybody $5 for a debit card, to own a debit card, 60 bucks a year. They figure people will complain, but they'll do it, and $60 a year, plus however many, uh, Democrat, uh, however many cards are out there are, uh, is a lot of money. Molly goes online, she goes to change.org, she gets 600,000 people to say they're gonna take their money out of Bank of America and put it in some other bank. The bank calls her up, the president calls her up, young lady, you don't understand banking. She's, her retort is, I don't understand banking, but I understand I don't have a job and you're charging me $60 more for something that doesn't give me any more service. 
They finally, after 40 days of attempting to stop this, cave in and get rid of the $5 charge. With one of the worst business timing and decisions I've ever heard of, Verizon three days later announces they're going to charge you $2 to pay your bill online. First of all, this is a really stupid business decision because it's actually much cheaper to process a payment online than it is by check, but they figure people won't complain, or they'll complain a lot, they won't do anything, and we'll get uh, $2 times 12 times 335 million subscribers in our bottom line for doing absolutely nothing. Molly Catchpole poll goes back on change.org. In two days, she gets 300,000 people to say they're going to switch to AT&T. Verizon rescinds their change that has never been heard from since. <laughs> now, that was one person. Why would you think you needed to start an, a, 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 an institution or go to an institution if one person can go online and do this? And it's happened I bet you it's happened 100,000 times in this country, and I bet you it's happened a million times around the world uh, since that time. You have such an enormous effect without going through any of the hassles of an institution, getting people together, having meetings, having disagreements, solving the disagreements, electing officers maybe. Why would you go through all that? <coughs> there's, a, there's a culture in the generation People love startups, right? But you don't like institutions, start your own. So they start a business. I think this generation engages in something that I call um, commitment with, uh, excuse me, cooperation without commitment. You have two or three people doing a startup. They come to a position where, where they di have difference of opinion. Instead of resolving the difference of opinion, they go, eh, shake hands, pat each other on the back, saying, I hope we get to work together, go off in their own direction, each pursues their own idea. Why? Because you can. The reason we've needed institutions is because it's the only way that you can further some cause or some company or some belief past your own interest in it, whether it's your lifespan or whether it's just you want to move on and do something else. Your idea dies without an institution. You don't care because you can just have another idea five minutes later and go online and get a million people to sign up for that. Now, it's, it's changing some because I think in this past campaign people realized that there was in fact some need to have an institution, but whatever institutions look like in the future for your age group is going to be incredibly different than they looked like uh, for my age group. We fought against institutions to change them. You fight against institutions to completely remake them or eliminate them. Uh, another question from a student before we open it up to questions from students or anyone else. Yeah, John. Um. So, you've commented before in support of the Iranian group MEK and said that um, in 2011, Madame uh, Rajavi Rizav wrote uh, the name that pronounced that wrong. We should not be called the terrorists, we should be recognizing her as president. Um, can you kind of explain that, given some of the controversies with that group as a former pro regime change terrorist organization? Uh, well, first of all, uh, this is a very abstruse issue, but. Uh, um, the MEK is the Mujahideen al-Haq, which is an uh, Iranian opposition group exiled. Um, they were on the terrorist list. It turned out they were uh, forced by a United States court to be taken off the terrorist list because they were put on there for political reasons. So that was the first reason I got involved in it. The second reason I got involved is because uh, this is a group, by the way, that's hated by the Iranian people because they fought on Saddam's side against Iraq, Iran during the Iraq-Iran war, but they're Iranians, they want to take over. Uh, the other problem was that we had promised the Mujahideen al Qaq, who was armed and had a big plot of land in Iraq courtesy of Saddam, um, that when we went into Iraq under, under W, um, they were armed. We went to them and said, we're going to take your arms and you can either give us them up or we'll run you over, and they gave us arms. In, they gave up their arms. In return, we gave each one of them a piece of paper, there were 4,000 of them at the time, that said, we promise to protect you. You will be a protected person under the Geneva Convention. The United States abandoned them. They began to be killed by Iraqis and the, by the Iraqis who were working for Iran and by the Iranians. And uh, we, I was involved in a group of people which was very bipartisan. John Bolton, interestingly, was one of the people that was involved. You work with who you get. Uh, uh, and we uh, were able to put enough pressure on the American government to honor their word. And for me, that was a human rights issue. And now they're all safe in Albania, and I don't do any, anything more with them. But 
you know, I think if the American government makes a promise to somebody that we're going to keep them safe, we owe, the, owe it to them to keep them safe. And they were being picked off in small numbers and in large numbers, uh, unarmed, and I didn't think that was right, and I didn't think that was good for American credibility, and that's why they got, I got involved. Okay, with that, we'll open it up to everyone, students or otherwise. Keith. So one of the things you were saying that um, there's a younger and younger group of people <coughs> that are coming to power in the Democratic Party and that this is a sort of peaceful transition. I was wondering about some of these recent things that people who are running against incumbents are going to have the DCCC not hire consultants to help people to run against incumbents. And what do you think of that sort of strategy? And what's the, what would have happened in the last election if people who were running against incumbent Democrats uh, were going to basically have the people who consulted with them punished by the DCCC? I think it's an incredibly stupid thing to do, and I've said so publicly. Um, you know, this is a, 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 in a democracy, you don't, try to restrict, restrict people's right to run for office. I've already said that I admire the Virginia party, which was a bit hidebound for at least turning around and supporting the people who ran against their candidates. And I think the DCCC has made a ridiculous mistake and I've publicly called them out for doing so. It's just stupidity. These are the future. Uh, if they beat an incumbent, that means the incumbent isn't doing their job and we're damn lucky to have a Democrat in the slot. So I think it's a terrible mistake. And it's typically inside the beltways. You have to, for, don't forget, Washington is middle school on steroids. For those of you, for those of you who have 13 year olds, you know exactly what I mean. Unlike the public perception, they are, not, but for the most part, not stupid and they're not crooks. There are some exceptions, obviously the big one at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But, but the fundamental thing is their culture is completely different. They have no idea what life is like for the other 299 million people or whatever it is that don't live inside the Beltway. Their currency is dinner parties. Did you get on television? Did my bill pass? What about your bill? Blah, blah, blah. Now, I have enormous respect for Nancy Pelosi because she knows the inside game better than anybody I know. And I'm not blaming her for this, although this couldn't have happened if she hadn't agreed to it. I think this is a fundamental mistake. We do not want to take declare war on a wing of our own party. That is how you divide parties. That is not how you keep them together. I intend to continue to speak out about this. Uh, and guess what? The truth is, this has no impact whatsoever because challengers to incumbents aren't going to get their kind, those kinds of consultants anyway. And the truth is, about most consultants, you're better off not having a consultant from Washington because they're mostly interested in making a lot of money in their own pockets and the candidate can go someplace else. So now that we've disposed of that question. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So you highlighted the enormous power of the internet uh, to create good change. Well, people are using the internet. Yes, yes. people are using it. And uh, they can use it for evil purposes as well. And part of what we've witnessed because of this equal access is a loss of the common truth and a loss of respect for facts. Getting back to a common set of truths and facts may require some regulation of the internet conversation, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, I think the people who have the obligation to um, regulate are the platforms. And it, it, here's the problem. Look, I, I think the internet has been transformative for the human race, and in many, most of the time in a good way. Uh, I, I actually don't use the word millennials. I call the generation that, call, that are called millennials first globals. It's the first global generation who actually has connections throughout the world, not just because they travel, but because they can go online and learn all kinds of things and have friends in many different countries, some of which don't have diplomatic relationships with the United States. The problem is that if you're allowed to put anything up on the internet, whether it's true or not, what we've lost is the editorial function. I mean, I, I have my problems with the media in this country, but there is an editor. And the editor makes a decision about what they can put in and what they can't. Um, and usually that decision is based on what is believed to be true and what's not true. I think the media has gotten uh, lax in the editor function because I think they're getting their butts kicked by the internet. We do, as a species, tend to like gossip. And we tend to like outrageous gossip. And the truth is, 
all of us, not just the Trump people, all of us tend to repeat gossip even though when we suspect it's gossip and we suspect it's not true because information is power and in some psychological way it gives us power to repeat something that's outrageous. We all do it. I mean, actually there's a whole studies of gossip and in, in how they function in human societies including primitive societies. So this is, a, this is a fault of the human species, not just the evil Russians and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the question is, what do you do and who becomes the arbitrator of what factor? When we had three major news stations and 90% of the American people watched the news on, in the 1960s and 70s, Walter Cronkite wasn't going to put something on that they didn't think was true. Now we have a problem because we have basically pr propaganda stations like Russia Today and Fox that say anything they want, whether it's true or not, and sometimes they know damn well it's not true. And that's a big problem too. So we could have government regulation. The problem with government regulation, as societies have found in the past, that if you allow the government to decide what's true and what's not true, then you soon find the government in the propaganda business. So I think the most reasonable thing to do is use newspapers as a model, even though they're very, very different than the sort of news, quote unquote, that you get on the internet, and require the platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and, and Google and others to have responsibility over printing stuff uh, and putting stuff out there that's not true. Is there a precedent? There certainly is. You know, here's one of the problems for Americans. We have the most extreme free speech laws in the country. Most people don't think of that because we all grew up with this as the norm. There is no other country in the world where you can say some of the things that we can say. In, in Germany, for example, if you criticize, the, if you say the Holocaust didn't exist, you serve time in jail. There are people in Germany today for saying the Holocaust didn't exist. It wouldn't happen in this country. In Britain, if you attack a politician and say something that's not true, you can be sued for libel. People are. They get big awards against them. Even the tabloids, outrageous as they are, are much more careful about saying stuff that would appear on the front page of the, of the New York Post or whatever. So. We are used to this extreme amount of free speech. The court has upheld it. I think probably that's the safest place to be. I get furious with the media. I think they're awful in many ways. The one reason I don't want media censorship by the government is because the media is the only place that keeps the government honest. By printing stories about misdoings by government, and we're always going to be tempted as human beings. We always have weaknesses. We're always, even those among us who believe we're moral creatures can be tempted in the worst ways. The only insurance is to have as much public discussion as possible. However, you do not deserve or have any First Amendment right to lie and to say and to bring hate and aim and put other people in, in danger, which has been done in numerous occasions. And I think the, the private sector has to be responsible for regulating that, not the government. So I think Facebook needs to deal with this, Instagram, Google needs to deal with it. Um, you know, even, there are even some smaller sites that really, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'd be perfectly happy to, uh, to take some of them off the air, but I don't think the government can make the decision to do that. I, I actually am probably one of the few Democrats who believes that what Peter Thiel did was a good thing when he sued the hell out of Gawker. I, don't, I think it is an invasion. I, mean, I have no use for Hulk Hogan, who's probably a Republican. But the truth is, if you print, so, print somebody's sex tape that's supposed to be private, then you deserve to have a big liability, and Gawker's now out of business. That's a much better way than having the government come in and say, oh, no, 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 because one no, no, no is somebody else's yes, 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 and the government shouldn't be the referee. Others? Sir? Uh, you talked about the centrists for the Democratic Party, and certainly that's true. We look at all in Orange County. When you look at the 15 of the 19 candidates, who are the bright centrists in there? <laughs> well, the problem is that the definition of a centrist is changing. Um, centrists today believe that same sex marriage is okay, and so do 68% of the American people. Uh, centrists today believe that universal health care is a good idea. They may be a difference among Democrats between the left and center about how you get there, but there's not a big debate, even among the American people at large, about whether we should have health insurance for everybody. Um, so I don't exactly know how to define a centrist. Um, a lot of centrism is how you say what you say. So one of my favorite candidates who didn't run was Chris Murphy of Connecticut, who happens to be Williams alumna, <laughs> alumnus. 
I, I really wanted him to win because he's a flaming liberal. He serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and so he actually knows something about foreign affairs, which I do think is very important for a president. <laughs> and he says things in a mild way that is disarming and that isn't, doesn't scare the hell out of people. That is really important. People are, you, I think one of the problems that politicians have is if you are in somebody's face, they can't hear you anymore because you're in their face. You make them defensive. If you make a case for them by respecting them and explaining, that's incredibly helpful to somebody who may not agree with you but might want to actually think about what you said. So uh, being a centrist may be as much about how you present yourself to the American people as it is about what kind of ideas you have. And I, we're in an evolution about this. I actually think this whole generation is more centrist than my generation's left. I also think they're much more polite than we are. I know they don't believe it. Probably the administration at Williams doesn't believe it. But the truth is, I remember what it was like and the way we talked to the people who were in the administration in college when I was there in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, it was very different than it is today. Very, very different. And it was not for the better. So um, I think the definition of being a centrist has probably changed. I think it's as much behavioral as, as it is programmatic. Others? I'm very concerned that even if the Democrats win the next election, that there won't be anything left, that things have been so divisive and as we have eviscerated our environmental laws. I wonder if you could address that. Give us hope. Oh, I, I think, you know, if the Democrats win, I think we're in back in business. I really do. I do. Um, I don't think we've eviscerated all our, our laws. I think the administration has eviscerated the law, rule of law, but I think we're, we'd like to live under the rule of law, and I don't think we're nearly in as bad shape as Great Britain is right now with dysfunctional, all three parties are completely dysfunctional, um, and they're about to destroy their economy, which, the, which half of them claim isn't true, and the other half were busy lying about it during the election, um, during the referendum. So, I mean, it could be worse. <laughs> um, I, look, I... I I actually think there's a hunger not to hate each other anymore. I really do. I think average people, first of all, there are a lot of families that are divided which would, who would not like to be divided anymore. Uh, Trump is an incredibly divisive person. It's not just that you know, our families are divided because some people believe in Trump and some people don't. It's Trump himself cranks this up as a weapon, as many authoritarian types have done. That needs to go. I, I do think there's, there is, I think actually one of the, I don't want to make gender generalizations here, but it is true that women have a more collaborative style of leadership in general than men do, and I think I'm thrilled that four women are running for president of the United States, and if one of them wins, I think that's likely, and it's not gender too, I mean, it's not entirely gender specific. There's such a thing as a woman who's tough as nails, as Margaret Thatcher proved, but I think this is the time for a healer and somebody who wants to be collaborative. I don't think you can collaborate with the right wing of the Republican Party. As, as the Tea Party proved, they wouldn't even let their own president have a victory or their own caucus have a victory. But I do think there's a tremendous hunger among average American people not to have us hate each other. Um, and I think the right president uh, will be able to, uh, to heal that gap. I don't think we have to suddenly adopt politics. And the, and the far right will do everything they can to antagonize us and they will do everything they can to keep the status quo, at some point the American people are going to have to decide to turn their back on that, and I think they will with the right leadership. Right now, I don't think we have the right leadership. We have, we have exactly the wrong leadership. Other thoughts? Sir. A quick statement for the moderator. It wasn't only young people who were energized by Howard Dean running for <laughs> president. All generations were. Um, to follow up on both your last two answers about centrism, and about collaborative <coughs> impulses. I just would like to, to retread that issue one more time with the thought that isn't the real question about centrism being corporate friendly? Isn't the question about the progressive base being more oriented to the social movements, climate change, Black Lives Matter, you know, the LGBTQ community, and labor? and minimum wage, and the Bill Clinton wing of the party was all about let's be more friendly to Wall Street, let's not antagonize Wall Street. Isn't that still, when we talk about do we need a centrist 
Is that really what people need? Don't we need someone that's a little more friendly to Wall Street and to the major banks and businesses? I, I think that's what centrist has come to mean, but I don't think that's what it does mean. I totally agree um, that the, the Wall Street has influenced both parties to a degree that's been incredibly unhelpful for the country. Not just unhelpful for um, poor people and working people, it's been incredibly unhelpful to all the other industries that are actually create jobs, which Wall Street mostly doesn't, except in New York City and places in Chicago. Um, so um, it is true that on some segments of the body politic, centrist has become a bad word. I don't think it has to be one, but I completely agree uh, that the time for catering to Wall Street has got to be over. Not because it's a democratic issue, because it's a national issue. You know, when capitalism gets out of whack, capitalism is at risk. I'm one of those people who believe that Franklin Roosevelt saved capitalism, because capitalism had very nearly destroyed the company by doing, I mean, the country by doing unbelievably con dis uh, destructive things. I think 2008 was capitalism run amok, with banks behaving badly, mortgage refinancing behaving badly. I s assume most of you have seen uh, the movie version of Michael Lewis's uh, extraordinary, extraordinary book. <laughs> Bill, uh, and the movie was even more extraordinary, especially when the starlet was in the bubble bath. That's the part I always remember. <laughs> but, but you know that that is true. I mean, these folks did not help the country when we needed help. And they, many of them went to jail, and more of them should have gone to jail. Uh, in fact, not enough of them did go to jail. That has to be fixed. But there's no particular place on the political spectrum that needs to fix that more than a centrist. We don't want to take down the whole American economic system. This has been the most extraordinary um, uh, country in the world for the last 200 years, given our growth rate. But we do need to take down things that are so, um, uh, that, that essentially are creating monopoly capitalism. Monopoly capitalism, the, Adam Smith would be the first person to tell you what a disaster monopoly capitalism was. We allowed that to happen for political reasons, for exactly the reason you just said. So it is true that centrist in some quarters is a bad word. I don't use it that way. I use the word centrist to, be, to, to begin to heal the country. Uh, and I do not think that centrists ought to have interest groups on Wall Street because I think Wall Street is out of control and it needs to be controlled. It does not need to be eliminated, but it absolutely needs to be controlled and regulated, which is one of the reasons I like Elizabeth Warren as much as I do. Because I think she's one of the few people who really understand exactly what you can do and what you shouldn't do. Others? I'm curious if you could comment on the most um, graceful path to health care for all. Sure. Um, I mean, we almost got there. Had it not been for Joe Lieberman, we'd be there today. The public option was the perfect way to get there. The public option was a part of the Affordable Care Act that didn't get passed because it needed 60 votes, and Joe changed his mind at the last minute for who knows what reason. There's lots of speculation, including that Connecticut is an insurance company, Mecca, and so forth and so on. So if you put in the public option and you give people a choice, between signing up at Medicare for any age and paying into it, or private insurance, the thinking was that now you would have a, a, uh, a way of getting around some of the manipulations of the insurance industry, and that many people would choose Medicare. But you would always, always give people a choice. Politics and bringing up a five-year-old have one, at least one thing in common. Choice matters. One of the most effective things I can remember doing with my children and now with my grandchildren is saying, would you like to go to bed now or would you like to go to bed in five minutes? Or <laughs> would you like to eat peas or would you prefer lima beans? You know, that gets you a lot further than eat this now or else. So, well, we're not so different than five-year-olds. We like to have choices. We do not want the government to tell us what to do. I don't care where you are in the political spectrum. We want to have choices. So let me choose between private insurance. If, if Medicare is so much better than private insurance, believe me, we'll all end up in Medicare. In fact, I think Medicare is better than private insurance. I think there's a lot less scamming of patients. I think there's a lot more predictability of rates. I actually think their fee schedule is more predictable. And I think most people by now would be in Medicare had that passed eight years ago. But not everybody. Here's some of the exceptions. 
If you are a very high wage company, your employees make $100 or $150,000 a year in a very high end medical uh, uh, instrument company or uh, a uh, high tech company or um, whatever. You can think of these. You are going to want employee based health care because you're going to give people a great deal because you're going to use it as enticement. I don't think we should deny people the opportunity. Let people have the choice. If you give, this is why I was against the individual mandate. It was bad politics. When we did health care for everybody under 18 in my state 25, 27 years ago, uh, we gave people a choice. We did not have an individual mandate. Now, I grant you this was for their children, and people are much more sensitive to what they have to do for their children. We had 1% of Vermonters who didn't get health care for their children voluntarily. We had 3% we couldn't find who were eligible for Medicare, that, Medicaid. And 1% of the people who were eligible for coverage didn't take it. 1%. For the price you pay for putting an individual mandate on somebody in this libertarian country that hates being told what to do by the government, it's not worth it. So you think you have to be practical about legislation. Don't just go for what you think makes sense book smart wise, which is one of the problems in Obamacare, which is, incidentally was written by the same people who wrote Romney Care. Um, be practical. Give people choices. If you want Medicare for all, it's going to be Medicare for all, except for those few people who, at their own expense, choose not to. The other thing is, we ought not to have a debate about what rich people can get. Rich people are going to get what they want, and it doesn't matter what society they're in. In Britain, you're not supposed to go outside the system. If you do, you go to Harley Street and you pay out of your own pocket. In Canada, you're not supposed to go outside the system. If you want to, you come to the United States and pay out of your own pocket. There is no society on the face of the earth where rich people don't get more than anybody else. I think we should argue about how to get the 95% what they need instead of worrying about penalizing the rich people for what they are ever. Let them do what they want. Let us have a system that works for everybody. And I think this is a system that works for everybody. We're going to do two more questions. All the way, standing in the back. You'll be the last two. You, and then sitting down. Uh, my question is more process oriented. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, Governor Dean. Um, you ran the DNC for several years. Uh, have you looked at the possibility of uh, using ranked choice voting in the primaries as opposed to uh, a single vote? Absolutely, I encourage it dramatically. I've been on that, that and getting rid of the Electoral College um, by uh, using the, uh, some of the processes that are you know, in play in the, in the legislature. I think Massachusetts and Vermont have already signed on to getting rid of the Electoral College when we get to 271 votes. Uh, and I also very much support. Here's the thing about ranked choice voting that's, that's so great. What's so great about it is everybody gets to be heard. So I, 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 we had a ranked choice voting bill uh, election in, in Vermont. And it was gotten rid of because the Republican, because the mayor who was elected under it was in, totally incompetent and really screwed up the city's finances. And then a Republican candidate killed it. Um, and because they convinced everybody the only reason this mayor was elected was because who was incompetent it was because of ranked choice voting. It's not true. Here's what you get for ranked choice voting. Everybody gets to be heard. Um, that is, if I don't get my first choice, I still have some say. Um, and the more important thing is, to me is that it's a civil election. San Francisco has ranked choice voting. Now, San Francisco's elections are not completely clean, but it doesn't pay to attack your rival because you're going to want your rival's second place votes. And if you go after one of your rivals big time, their second place votes are going somewhere else if you're not the one that, if you, you know, if you don't make the first cut. So this is very complicated, but it's a system that worked really well. In Maine, for example, uh, a right winger won a congressional seat with 46% of the vote. Well, it turned out that 54% of the people didn't want the right winger. So there was ranked choice voting, and the other candidates' votes went back to the Democrat, we picked up a Democratic seat. In fairness, it could work that way for a Republican, too. The, the thing about ranked choice voting is the losers get a choice, and the third party is never a spoiler. And I think, it, I, I think you know, we do need third parties in this country. The trouble with third parties is they always end up being Ralph Nader in Florida, which introduced George W. Bush, and for want of that, we would never have had the Iraq War. 
Well, Ralph Nader is not a threat in ranked choice voting, and he's going to put some good ideas on the table that we should be hearing. But right now, there's enormous pressure not to do that. Um, you know, Howard Schultz would not be a threat to the Democrats if, uh, if we had ranked choice voting, because presumably people would vote for Howard Schultz, and, and then in the second round, they'd move their vote to somebody else. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I think the answer to that is, uh, if ranked choice voting, I'm not going to take the time to explain it if you don't know what it is, but go look it up. It sounds really complicated, but in practice, it's incredibly easy and it's really important. So, last question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering earlier, you said that um, media keeps government honest and perpetuate or promotes discussion, but many people turn to partisan news sources and like places like Fox News perpetuate the like, fake news of the president, so I was wondering how you thought this should be reconciled. Um, well, again, I don't think the government can regulate the media. That's the one bottom line thing. Because, um, Fox News is being punished right now for their extremist views like Tucker Carlson. I mean, they, he has lost an enormous amount of advertising. Um, Breitbart has been punished. They've lost 4,000 advertisers in the last couple of years because of the sleeping giants. Um, and I think that's the best way to punish media outlets that, you know, are, are devoid of truth and harmful to the country is to, you know, commercial boycotts and things like that by ordinary people. I think it's fine, but I, I'm at I'm at somewhat of a loss to uh, try to censor people. Um, I, I think it has to be if it's not going to be you can I think you can what you can do and what is actually happening at Fox if you're careful there are people on Fox who are actually will correct Trump. There are just not, not many of them, and they only play at times when Trump is asleep, which is <laughs> because the less they be heard. Um, but, the, but commercial, you know, if average people are offended, they should use their, their uh, purchasing power to affect um, who, who support those programs, and I think that's fair game. The only, again, as I say, there's lots of different things you can do. One thing I think you cannot do, uh, I also think lawsuits are fair in the case of somebody like Alex Jones, who basically incites violence. Um, but I, I think the one place I, you have to draw the line, uh, the, you know, the press doesn't do this very often, but when they do it, it's really necessary, is they basically defend democracy against the government when the, the government is not inclined to be as democratic and open as they should be, and I think that's critical. And with that, we've reached the appointed time. So please join me in thanking Governor Dean for being here.